Greetings. Let's continue from where we left last time. So, from where we left, left last time, we talked about uh, the SI units that we are going to be using in fluid mechanics, primary units and also derived units. So, for primary units, we need to know that we have got seven of them that uh, under standard units or SI system of units that we will use. So, the primary units that we have, they are the ones listed in this table. We have got length, mass, time, temperature, current, luminosity. These are the seven primary units that we need. And from these seven, we can come up with derived units. For example, pressure, for we know that pressure is equal to force per unit area. So which means we are going to take the unit for force um, per unit area. And we know that force, the standard units for force, is mass times acceleration. So from there, we've got our mass and we've got our acceleration. Then from acceleration, we know that acceleration is mass per unit uh, mass per unit time squared or mass over a second squared. So, which means from there, if you're going to put pressure in terms of derived units, we need to consider Newton meter to the power minus two. But Newton now is force, so we need to consider this force to put it also as a standard or primary unit where we are going to get kg per meter per second squared. So, which means in this case, pressure he has been reduced to give us uh, the units that are from primary units or from the derived this one now becomes our derived units where we are combining mass length and time to give us the units of pressure so this is just an example that uh, we can look at but basically all these units that we have here they are derived units and they are derived from the primary units that we have so in fluid mechanics this is not mathematics whatever you do the answer that you have to get you have to always always give the units preferably in SI units the ones that have been listed here okay so from derived units the other thing that we looked at again last time was to differentiate between fluids and solid mechanics so in summary what we can say is for fluid mechanics we are dealing with uh, fluids that or in fluids we are dealing with continuous stream of fluids then in solids we are going to consider individual elements whereas again in fluids we know that a fluid will continue to deform will continuously deform under uh, when subjected to any force whereas in solids solids are able to resist deformation so which means now that thing that we can look at is fluids lack the ability of solids to def to resist deformation so these are some of the uh, differences that we can look at between solids and fluids primarily primarily which means that uh, fluids continuously deform when subjected to any force. For example, if we've got uh, this element of fluid that we have here, if we subject a force at point B and C, like what we have here, we'll see that this rectangular will deform, this rectangular shape will deform as a result of these two forces that we have. Now, if it's a fluid, it will continue to deform. So it means a fluid will deform continuously or flows once subjected to this shearing force that we have here. Whereas if it's a solid, when you apply this shearing force, it has got the ability to resist to deformation. So for a fluid, it will either flow or it will continue to deform under this shearing force that we have here. So the other thing that you can talk about is uh, when fluids are at rest, it implies that there are no shearing forces that are acting on it and if there's any force that is going to act on this fluid is supposed to act perpendicular to the fluid so we can say that a fluid is at rest then there are no shearing forces when a fluid is at rest then when we are going to apply any force on the fluid it's supposed to be acting perpendicular to the fluid so what it means even if a container is cylindrical or is spherical or it's, it's got some cave the force that is going to act at that cave point is supposed to be perpendicular so in that in other words supposed to be tangential to the cave that we have so that we can have that uh, issues of having the force acting perpendicular to the fluid so 
Last time we also talked about some of the bounded conditions that we have which are non-slip conditions. So consider a fluid that is flowing maybe in a wall or in a pipe like this, what we have here. So which means according to non-shear or non-slip conditions, the fluid close to the surface, the velocity will be equal to zero. And the velocity will start increasing until it reaches maximum velocity at the center of the pipe, like here what we have. So which means now, this is known as zero velocity that we have, that at the next to the wall, we've got what is known as zero velocity. So what it means is, is the fluid would tend to stick to the wall. So depending on the viscosity of the fluid, uh, the higher the viscosity, the more the fluid has got that tendency to stick to the wall. So which means this curve that we are going to have is we have got zero velocity near to the wall and the maximum velocity at the center. So from there now we can come up with what is known as a velocity profile. Like so, like what we have here, this is known as a velocity velocity profile. So a velocity profile will also give us what is known as a velocity gradient. And the velocity gradient can be defined as change in velocity over change in y. So this change in velocity here, we've got uh, the maximum velocity at the center. Velocity is in decreasing as we go towards the, the wall. So which means this change in velocity against the y, our y is the vertical direction in this case, will give us what is known as the velocity gradient. So when you see du over dy, what it means is this is our velocity gradient. So as fluids are usually near surface surfaces, there is usually a velocity gradient. So when you get this velocity gradient, uh, we are going to also be able to define and calculate shear stresses and shear forces due to the velocity gradient that we have. So for example here, shear forces exist in a fluid moving close to a wall. So if we don't have the fluid near the wall, so which means in other words, we don't have any velocity gradient if, if we are not near the wall. So which means the velocity is going to be the same as indicated by these lines that are equal of length. So which means near the wall, away from the wall, we don't have any velocity gradient. Therefore, no shearing stresses. So shearing stresses, they come as a result of du over dy. Okay, so we'll come back to du over dy as we progress with the course. Uh, especially in this chapter where we are in and when we are going to define shearing stresses in the Newtonian law or Newt uh, Newton's law of um, fluids. So what we want to look at now is to define some terms that we are going to use in this course. For example, first thing that we need to define is what is known as mass density. How do you define mass density? Mass density is defined as mass of fluid per unit volume and the symbol that we use is rho and the unit that we use is kg per meter cubic so from there there are some densities that we need to know for example we need to know the density of water which is 1000 kg per meter cubic you are not given this value the density of water, you are not given the value for density of water, so which means you will need to, to know the density of water, which is 1000 kg meters per second. The other thing that you need to know is the density of mercury, which is 13,546, but in this course, we will round it off to 13,600 for simplicity of calculations. But you can use the same 13,546, but for you to remember and to know it well, we, will go, we are going to use 13,546 kgs per meter cubic. Then the other density we need to know is density of air, which is 1.23 kgs per meter cubic. Density of paraffin, uh, yes, you can know it, but most of the time the question will not ask you to uh, to remember the density of paraffin. So most of the questions, either you are calculating the density of oils or whatever it is, or you are given in the question. But these three, water, mercury, and air, it's a must to know the densities for these three. Then the next thing that we need to define is what is known as specific weight or weight density so specific weight 
or the other books you find is written as weight density. And specific weight can be defined as the weight of the fluid divided by the volume of the fluid. So we've got mass density, then we've got specific weight. So we've got weight of the fluid divided by the volume of the fluid. And we know that the weight of the fluid can be defined as mass of the fluid multiplied by acceleration due to gravity over the volume of the fluid. So when we write mass of the fluid multiplied by acceleration due to gravity, so which means we can write mg over volume of the fluid. So when you write mg over volume of the fluid, if we do our mat mathematics very well, specific weight can reduce to just writing it as density multiplied by g. And we know volume. Volume can be defined as what? So from this formula that we have mass density, volume can be defined as mass over density. So if we've got mass over density, then we come back to specific weight where we have defined it as mass of fluid multiplied by acceleration due to gravity over volume of the fluid. So volume, if you say mass multiplied by uh, mass over your density of the fluid, we can get our specific weight with the symbol omega, which is equal to rho g. So whenever we see rho g, this is known as our specific weight or mass density. So the next thing that we need to look at is also what is known as uh, specific volume. Specific volume is defined as volume of the fluid over mass of the fluid. We might not be able to see it here uh, on this PowerPoint that we have, but it's something that we need to put aside, known as specific volume, which is volume of the fluid divided by the mass of the fluid. So which means uh, specific volume is the inverse of density. Specific volume is the inverse of density. What does it mean? It means that specific volume is equal to 1 over rho, or rho to the power minus 1. Okay, then the next thing that we need is what is known as relative density. So relative density, here we don't need to put any units because when it's relative density, it means it's the density of the substance divided by the density of water at 4 degrees. So if you are dealing with liquids, relative density is defined as the density of the liquid divided by the density of water at 4 degrees Celsius. Okay, for example, if you want to find the uh, relative density of water, it's equal to 1. Why? Because water, our substance now is water. So water, density of water divided by density of water at 4 degrees will give us 1. Then, for example, density of mercury in this case will be 13.5 because we are saying the density of the substance, which is, which is the density of the mercury, divided by the density of water, which is 13,546 or 13,600, like what we said. So when you divide those two, we are going to get 13.5. No units, because it's relative density. Then the other thing that we also need to define is what is known as specific gravity. So specific gravity is defined as the weight density of liquid divided by weight density of water. Weight density of liquid divided by weight density of water. Then when we are dealing with gases, specific gravity is defined as weight density of gas Weight density of gas divided, divided by weight density of air. So, when we play around with mathematics, specific gravity, we will see that at the end of the day we can uh, get uh, a reduced form of sigma, which would be almost like our relative d uh, density. If we make sure that uh, uh, our mass and all those uh, properties are the same, we are going to get density is equal to, uh, sorry, sigma is equal to density of the substance over density of water. Okay, so these are some of the terms that we are going to use in the course. So as I'm still on this chapter, I want you to take note of this question and try to answer this question. So wherever you are, 
just try to write down this question and try to find the answer. So the question is calculate the specific weight, comma, density, and specific gravity of one liter of a liquid which weighs seven newtons. So let me take that question again. It's calculate the specific weight, comma, density, and specific gravity of one liter of a liquid which weighs seven newtons. So during your spare time, or you can pause this video and try to calculate this problem using the same definitions that we've used here. This is just a simple question that you can look at to solve or to just make sure that you remember what you have done. So now, as we continue with properties of fluids, for example, when you've got a rectangular, like in this case, we've got a rectangular element under the action of force. So we can see from here that the fluid, in this case, is a three-dimensional flow that we have. So which means the force in this direction, the force in this direction, and the other force going the opposite direction, which means this one is a shearing force that we have. So from shearing force, if it's three dimension, we are going to get a fluid that is going to continuously deform in this direction and flow in one direction like that. So for us to get the shearing forces, the first thing that we need is to calculate the area. So from the area, we can say A is equal to dz multiplied by dx. So which means change in uh, the z direction multiplied by the change in the x direction for us to get the area. So after getting the area, we know that a shearing stress is defined as force per unit area. So which means our shearing stress will be equal to the force over the area that we are looking at. So what we need to look at is, again, is the deformation which shear stress causes, causes is measured by the angle phi and is known as shear strain. So from this definition, and also like how we, we defined um, a fluid last time, we say that a fluid has got shear stress which is directly proportional to shear strain rate. So if you remember that thing, what we talked about last time, we said shear stress is directly proportional to shear strain rate for fluids. So from here now, mathematically, we can write it in this form. We've got shear stress directly proportional to shear strain rate, which is phi per unit time. So from all these calculations, if you want to find our shear strain using um, those my trigonometrical, uh, trigonometrical identities and also trig equations and um, tan, theta, and sine, we can see that shear strain, this angle, can be calculated by getting x over y to get our angle which is shear strain. So if I come back, get back to our diagram here, so for us to get this phi, we are supposed to divide x over y to get our phi. So when you get now back to our equation to get this phi, we can say that tau is equal to a constant multiplied by phi over t. So we know that in mathematics that when you are going to remove this proportional, uh, proportionality symbol, we are supposed to include an equal sign plus a constant. So we already know that from this equation, we are going to get tau is equal to constant multiplied by u over y. When we substitute our phi, the equation will reduce to this. Okay, so going forward, this equation will give us um, the final equation that you are going to get, which is tau is equal to a constant multiplied by du over dy. And du over dy is known as the velocity gradient. So from the velocity gradient and the constant that we have, we are going to include a constant of proportionality, which is known as dynamic viscosity. So dynamic viscosity mu, the simple mu. So the final equation that you are going to get is known as the Newton's law of viscosity. Newton's law of viscosity, which is tau is equal to mu multiplied by du over dy. And any fluid that obeys this law is known as Newtonian fluid.
or sometimes we call it real fluids newtonian fluid or real fluid so from newtonian fluid we know that it's going to obey this law which is tau is equal to mu du over dy oh of course there are some other fluids that do not obey newton's law of viscosity and we've got a general equation that we have which is tau is equal to a which is a constant plus b a constant multiplied by change in u over change in y or multiplied by the velocity gradient to the power n so this is the general formula that we use for fluids that do not obey newton's law of viscosity for example this same formula we can reduce it again to give us this same formula that we have for newton's law of viscosity how if we take a to be equal to zero take b to be equal to mu and n equal to one if we plug in these values in this general equation one that is called the general relationship it will still give us the newton's law of viscosity you can try that okay so the next thing now that we need to look at is to define what is known as viscosity what is viscosity so from newton's law of uh, viscosity we can make mu the subject formula and it will give us mu is equal to tau divided by velocity gradient tau divided by velocity gradient so from there the units that we are going to use is newton second per meter squared and the other units that we are going to use are known as poise p o i s e or just capital letter p where 1 newton second per meter squared is equal to 10 poise 1 newton second per meter squared is equal to 10 poise so there are some other instances whereby the question will ask you to leave your answer in form of poise so you will need to know how to convert from poise to newton's second per square meter or vice versa so this one is known as mu is known as dynamic viscosity and if the question comes is giving you values or asking you to calculate viscosity usually is the dynamic viscosity that we'll be talking about of course there's another kind of type of viscosity that we have which is known as kinematic viscosity with a symbol which is almost like a v so this one is equal to kinematic viscosity is equal to dynamic viscosity per unit density so if you are given kinematic viscosity you will need to know this formula to convert your kinematic viscosity to dynamic viscosity using this formula so kinematic viscosity is equal to dynamic viscosity divided by density and these are the units that we have of course there are another units that we use which are stocks so you need also to know how to convert these units to stocks like what we did here with the poise for dynamic viscosity okay so the graph that we have here also talks about all the types of fluids most of the types of the fluids that we have in this world where we've got plastic fluids pseudoplastic newtonian fluids dilatant fluid ideal fluids and all these are the types of fluids that we have here um, and all these type of fluids can be defined using this formula that we have here which is a general relationship of tau is equal to a plus b multiplied by velocity gradient to the power n so when you've got any challenges please contact me and we see how best we can uh, solve all the challenges that you might be facing but all these uh, type of fluids that we have they are governed also by that formula which is tau is equal to a plus b multiplied by velocity gradient to the power n so we need also to know these graphs how they we come about this graph as we look at shear stress against the rate of shear which is du over dy okay so next time when you're in a shop and you want to buy milk or something like that you can just use your engineering skills to say that you are looking for pseudoplastic fluid for the pseudoplastic fluid one of the example for a pseudoplastic fluid is milk clay cement so those are some of the things that you might need to look at then 
there's also what is known as being um, plastic example is sewage sludge so if you don't want to say sewage sludge you can just say this is one of the type of being um, plastic fluids that we have okay so as we come to the end of this lecture for today's lecture we we need to also look at uh, liquids versus gases what is the difference between liquids and gases and all those stuff so this is just general knowledge that you can read through and come to understand on your own and one of the questions that you always come across in most of this in uh, in this course is what are the causes of viscosity in fluids so we need to know what are the causes of viscosity in gases and the causes of viscosity in liquids so it's one of the things that you also need to go through and read on your own to understand what are the causes of viscosity in fluids and the causes of viscosity in liquids and also to know like what are the effects of temperature to the viscosity in gases and in liquids and what are the effects of pressure to the viscosity in gases and also viscosity in liquids uh, if we increase the temperature do we increase viscosity or do we reduce viscosity in gases and also in liquids do we increase viscosity or reduce viscosity if we increase the temperature so it's something that we also need to look at you can research on your own to find out what are the effects of temperature and effects of pressure to viscosity in gases and in liquids okay so for this lecture uh, I remember I gave you some of the questions to look at um, prior to this question to this lecture so here are some of the tutorial questions that we might need to go through uh, during our spare time so if you look at problem 1.14 we will need to apply Newton's law of viscosity for us to solve this problem so kindly go through this problem and try to find out how to solve and find the thickness of the oil film okay here we are looking at calculating the power loss so we need to find what is the power loss here when we've got um, a shaft and a sleeve that is rotating at a given rpm that we have here and we've we've put some lubricating oil here which is about 1.5 millimeters so we need to find what will be the power loss when we've got a mechanism like this so as an idea we need to start from newton's law of viscosity same with this question that we have that we are pulling a metal which has been put at the center of a fluid then also we change this a uh, metal to come either towards this side or this side to find out what will be the effect of moving this metal towards the walls of the pipe or or this gap that we have was we've got a vertical gap 2.2 centimeters that has been filled with a fluid of viscosity 2 newton second per square meter okay similar with this question we are looking now at velocity profiles but in this question what we need to find is to develop a relationship a relation of drag force exerted on the pipe so we are still using newton's law of viscosity so um the other question that I want us to look at is problem 2.47. So problem 2.45 and problem 2.47, you will need to submit it uh, before Monday, next week Monday. You need to send the answers for this one, for problem 2.45 and problem 2.47. You will need to submit your answers via Edmodo. Uh, and it's individual assignment that you need to assign to, 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 to send as soon as possible where we need now to apply what we have learned in this class um, and send our answers as soon as possible thank you very much for your time and attention